uh, we are delighted to welcome Stephen to our first inaugural presentation in the Author Talk series. So it, there's a lot of firsts here today and we're really thrilled about that. So I'll just read from uh, Stephen's biography, if I may, just to introduce uh, our guest speaker. Stephen was born in Chicago and grew up on the east coast of America. He lived in London for 12 years before returning to the United States in 1999. He now lives in Massachusetts and Torino, Italy. His books have been published in 16 countries and include two works of nonfiction, a collection of short stories and seven novels, including Human Capital and Security. Amadon's novels have appeared on many books of the year's list and Human Capital was selected by Jonathan Yardley, chief critic of The Washington Post, as one of the five best novels of 2004. Paolo Verizzi's Italian film version of Human Capital, Il Capitale Umano, forgive the pronunciation with an Irish accent, <laughs> and was selected to represent Italy as best foreign language film in the 2015 Oscars. A film adaptation of the novel Security, directed by Peter Chelsom and with cast starring Marco D'Amore and others, uh, was released in Italy in May 2021 and worldwide by Netflix in 2021. So that's something maybe people could follow up on. Stephen Amidon's new novel, Locust Lane, will be released January 2023. And I can attest to the fact that we actually have Stephen Amidon's <laughs> novel. Thank you again. And it's good to be here. Uh, I thought I would, um, and, and hello to people at home, um, I thought I would... Uh, do a little reading from the book, and then we could uh, have a conversation if of any any nature you want. Um, I, I thought I'd read the prologue, uh, the first part of the book, and then which introduces uh, uh, Patrick Noon, who's a who's kind of the reluctant hero of the book, if you will. Uh, he started out not being that. He started out being a very minor character, but I grew to like him as I started writing. And then the second part of the book is the mother of, of a young woman who dies early in the book, Danielle, who's a... Um, or rather, uh, not really of of this community. This is a very upper upper class kind of community outside of Boston, and she's she's more from working class. She's in Watertown and works in a jewelry store. And she and Patrick hit it off, and uh, in the course of the book. Um, so this is the prologue uh, of Locust Lane. Uh, no animals were badly injured in the making of this book. I uh, uh, warn you first. I mean, I, this is the riskiest opening sentence in, of any book I've ever done, I've been told, but rest assured. Uh, he hit the dog on Locust. It came out of nowhere, a blur of black motion. He swerved, but not enough. The bumper's edge caught the animal's hindquarters, sending it spinning back into the night. Its yelp harmonized with the shriek of breaking tires. And then he'd stopped in the middle of the road, his heart racing, thinking that maybe going out for a drive wasn't such a good idea after all. It took him a moment to locate the stricken animal. It had fled back the way it had come, but only made it as far as the nearest lawn, where it was now turning in circles, nipping at its flank, locked in futile pursuit of its pain. It lay down, it finally lay down and began to lick furiously at the point of impact. The dog was big and black. A Labrador, maybe, or a Labrador and something else. Patrick didn't know dogs. He checked the nearby houses to see if lights were flaring as homeowners in robes emerged onto front porches. All was quiet. The dashboard clock read 3.11 a.m. It was entirely possible the event had gone unnoticed by the residents of Locust Lane. The setbacks here were deep, the windows tightly sealed. Trees shrouded most of the house fronts. Things that happened on the street were a long way off. The dog continued to nurse its wound, though its movements suggested a recovery was in progress. Patrick told himself to drive on. He wasn't at fault. Dogs weren't allowed to run free in Emerson. Everybody knew that. A six-foot leash was required. There were signs everywhere, and he was not necessarily under the legal limit. The last thing he needed was to wind up walking the sobriety tightrope for some yawning suburban cop. Go home, he thought. Finish the bottle. Hit the sack. You know the drill. Dawn will come, followed by another barren day. But he couldn't do it. He'd injured a living thing. That made him responsible for it. He had to help. 
He didn't need another item in the overladen shopping cart of guilt he was pushing around already. He'd made a deal with himself not to abandon decency. He could leave everything else behind, but not that. He pulled the car to the side of the road. The dog remained curled on the grass, although it was fussing with its flank less avidly. Having committed himself to helping, Patrick now understood that he had no idea what to do. Loading a large, frightened, and potentially bloody creature into his BMW M3 and transporting it to an all-night animal hospital was out of the question. And he certainly wasn't dragging it back home. Whatever he was going to do would have to be done right here. The best he could come up with was to see if there was a tag on its collar, a number to call. He got out of the car. The dog watched him, waiting for the human to define the situation. Good boy, Patrick said although he had no evidence that the dog was either of these things. It emitted a brief whine, more of a radar ping than a call for help. It was taking the measure of this creature who'd bought the pain. Its tail quivered in an unfriendly way. Patrick held out his right hand as a gesture of peace, palm down, fingers dangling, like royalty expecting a kiss. This was more or less the extent of his knowledge of canine communication. He'd never had a dog. The wounded animal rose shakily, holding its back right paw a few inches off the grass. Standing was a good sign. No spinal damage, presumably no vital organs ruptured. It could limp back home to be cared for by the idiot who let it run free in the middle of the night. Patrick turned back to his car, but froze when the dog growled, low and ominous, like a waste disposal waiting for debris. He turned to face it. Previously flat fur on the back of its neck had risen into a staticky bristle. It took a menacing step forward. That injured leg seemed to be getting better by the second. Okay, Patrick thought, time to call it a night. He showed the dog his hand again, this time offering his flat palm, a cop stopping traffic. There was no need for drama. Whosever name was on that collar could take it from here. Get themselves a six-foot leash and obey the damned law. He took a step backward. The dog took a mirroring step forward. Patrick wondered if his hand gestures meant something different to the dog than what he'd intended. He cast a quick glance over his shoulder. He'd left the car door open. That was good. Safety was just five quick strides away. He was pretty sure he, had, he could make it there before a three-legged dog. But then the animal turned its head, its attention drawn to something in the thick copse of trees that separated the residential behemoth directly in front of Patrick from the even larger house next door. Patrick followed its gaze. At first, all he could see was varying degrees of nothingness. The trees were dense, knotted together by a network of vines. But then something defined itself, a man-sized delineation of the darkness, a human being tall, broad-shouldered, watching from the shadows a hundred feet away. What the hell? Is this your dog? Patrick called out. There was no response. Hello? Nothing. Now this made no sense. Why would the dog's owner be hiding in the trees? The town's leash penalties were, weren't that harsh, unless it wasn't the dog's owner. But vagabonds and lurkers weren't exactly common in Emerson. As far as he knew, the town's homeless population consisted of a small, ever-shifting squad of men cooling their heels at the Hilton after getting booted by aggrieved wives. He should know, having been one of them last year. He looked back at the dog just as it made up its mind about whomever it had seen in the shadows and turned its attention back to Patrick, at which point it made up its mind about him as well, and not in a good way. It growls, its growl deepened. It took another ominous step forward, the kind of murderous stealth on display in cable shows about the Serengeti. That injured leg appeared to have undergone a full recovery. Okay, time to go, with haste. Resurrecting a move from his wide receiver days, Patrick emphatically stamped his right foot forward, then pivoted and headed in the opposite direction. All he needed to be home free was five strides, a nifty spin into the car, and a slam door. And he almost made it, his front foot was already in when he, there was a sharp explosion of pain on his trailing hamstring. The dog had bitten him. Luckily, its jaws didn't find purchase. Patrick's momentum allowed him to reach the driver's seat and pull the door shut behind him. 
Patrick pulled the door all the way closed as the dog limped off towards that dem co de dense copse of trees where a hidden man had just impassively watched it attack another human being. He gingerly probed the back of his injured thigh. The trousers were torn, but there was no evidence of blood. The adrenaline continued to pump, fueling anger now. What the hell had just happened? Why hadn't that asshole intervened? Had he given the dog some sort of secret command? Attack command? Patrick turned on his engine and maneuvered until his high beams illuminated the woods. But there was no one there. Just trees and vines. And of course the darkness, patiently waiting for the end of this frantic little interruption of its dominion. Back at the townhouse, Patrick stripped off his torn pants and inspected the wound. The skin hadn't been broken, though he suspected there was a nasty bruise to come. He slathered, slathered it with antiseptic cream just to be safe, then applied an ice pack. For the relief of pain, a large tubbler of St. Suntory scotch and two ibuprofen. It was now approaching four. He should be in bed. He should have been in bed when the dog was biting him. He should have been in bed when he decided to go for a drive. But a dream had awakened him, driving him clean out of the house. Not a dream, really, but a disembodied voice, clearer and closer than any dream could ever be. Dad, can you come get me? It had not been from when Gabriella was a girl, sunny and carefree, needing to be picked up from soccer practice or an afternoon at the mall. Nor was it her latter self, pleading and ravaged and shattered, calling from a burrowed, borrowed burner phone, or reversing the $24.99 a minute charge from a jailhouse pay phone. No, this call came from here, the here and now, from the young woman she would have been, confident and a little impatient, on the cusp of her adult life, doing her father, her father a favor by allowing him to do this favor for her. He wasn't in bed when she spoke to him, but rather in his old recliner, the only piece of furniture he'd extracted from his vanished life. It took him a minute to find his bearings. He wore the clothes he'd changed in, into after work, dockers in a polo shirt. There was a tumbler filled with the whiskey-tinted ice melt and a bowl of pistachio nuts on the table beside him. The Discovery Channel was broadcasting a muted show about bearded men on a boat fighting the elements. Sleep banished, he'd driven. He followed a random course through town. He turned left, he turned right. It didn't matter as long as he kept moving. On center, through the town center, where nothing was open but everything was brightly lit, past the high school where a lone car sat in a vast lot, sodium light raining down over it like a warm drizzle, past the mobile mini-mart where a hopper-esque figure sat encased in bulletproof glass, and then on to Locust where the black dog crossed, crossed his path. He should try to get some sleep in the small patch of night remaining, although that wouldn't come unassisted. Not with the pain in his leg, the residual adrenaline cor still coursing through his veins. And so he topped up on the Japanese wonder drug and contemplated that figure in the woods. The more he thought about it, the more it pissed him off. He couldn't imagine anyone in this town failing to intervene as their pet got hit, attacked a strain and attacked a stranger. That animal had probably had more spent on its well-being than three quarters of the world's children. And yet, not a peep from the woods. If the man just happened to be there by coincidence, then what was he doing there? It didn't add up. He contemplated calling the police to report a prowler, a dog on the loose, but he could see how such a call would go. He listened patiently, they'd listen patiently, send a patrol car to Locust, find nothing. Besides, Patrick wasn't exactly on the best of terms with the local cops. No, this was over and done with. He decided to allot himself two more drinks. That would do the trick, filling in the looming hours before he'd have to rise and shine, before the wasteland of the morning would finally creep into view. So now we skip forward to uh, several chapters later. Daniel has met Danielle at the police station and then later at the house where he hit the dog. He randomly went there and she was there because her daughter had been killed in a house right near there, murdered. And at this point, the police investigation has determined that there were three other kids in the house with her. 
but nobody's taking responsibility. Nobody claims to know what happened to her. She was house sitting at the house. She was dog sitting at the house. She was dog sitting the black dog whose name is Thor. And like I say, he's fine. Um, Eden, the girl, is not. And so Patrick has, is developing a relationship with Danielle. Patrick is, 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 is someone who is mysteriously showing up in Danielle's life as she's trying to figure out what the hell happened to her daughter out here in Emerson. So this comes after yet another uh, frustrating meeting Danielle has with the police. Um, Danielle thought about Patrick Noon, wondering how he fit into it all. Lost on the streets of his own town at three in the morning. Drunk, probably. Maybe even crazy in a way Danielle didn't yet understand. His story about the dog would have been difficult to believe if she herself hadn't seen the thing limping. She should be taking everything this man told her with a bolder-sized grain of salt, but for some reason she trusted him. And yet there was something he still couldn't bring himself to say to her. For the thousandth time since their improbable late-night meeting outside the house where her daughter died, she could hear that unfinished, unfinished sentence. There was... The card he'd handed her was in her purse. The business card he'd handed her was in her purse. It was black and white, yet somehow radiant. The letters were raised a little. It made her want to run her thumb over them like she was blind. It suggested the world she'd never inhabited, the place where things were easy. To her surprise, she was put right through to him. To her even greater surprise, he agreed to meet her. To, but it was no surprise at all that he suggested a bar out on Route 9. The Royal Lounge looked like it had been in business continu continuously since they invented liquor. She arrived first. Finding a booth wasn't a challenge. The REO Speedwagon song playing o softly over the cheap speakers sounded like someone was vacuuming the back room. A fat drinker at the bar turned lab laboriously to check her out. She narrowed her eyes and he kept turning laboriously until he was facing the bar again, a surprisingly graceful pirouette of rejection. Patrick arrived wearing an expensive suit and sunglasses that the boys she'd grown up with would have risked prison time to steal. Whatever else he might have been, the man certainly was handsome. He had the good grace not to smile at her as he slid into the booth. When he took off his glasses, the whites of his eyes were as clear as his business card, and he didn't smell of alcohol, at least not more than the booth's ruptured nogahide seats. How are you holding up, he asked. I don't know, she said, functioning. Functioning is good, better than the opposite anyway. Is it, she asked. He asked what she wanted to drink. She said Chardonnay because she wanted a drink, but she didn't want that much of a drink. He went to get their refreshments. The bartender, a short woman in her 60s who looked like she'd rather be working just about anywhere else on God's green earth than the Royal Lounge, greeted Patrick familiarly. He stared at the bar as he waited for the drinks. Danielle took the opportunity to study him. To say he didn't belong in this place was a massive understatement. He looked like he belonged in one of those downtown clubs whose heavy doors were guarded by men dressed like they were protecting the Queen of England. This could be colder, he said apologetically as he placed the glass in front of her. She shrugged. She hadn't come here for the Chardonnay. He was drinking something clear with a slice of lime. There was an interval of silence that would have normally been filled with small talk. He seemed comfortable in ha inhabiting it with her. So I'm wondering why they haven't arrested this kid yet, she said finally. What, what have the police told you about that? Nothing. What do you know about him? One of the kids has become a suspect. I'm sorry. What have, the, what have the police told you about that? Nothing. What do you know about him? I know his father, Patrick said. He had a restaurant in town. People are surprised. Are you? I'm not really surprised by much these days, Patrick said, but yeah, I guess I am. It just doesn't fit. I'm sorry if that's uncomfortable for you to hear, but there it is. He took a drink like he needed it, not gulping it down exactly, just savoring it. You said something last night, she said. Well, you started to say something. He watched her, not unfriendly, just guarded. You said, there was. But then you stopped yourself. Did I? Yes, you did. Like you saw something other than the dog when you stopped your car. He looked into his glass as he swirled the ice and lime. 
This man had something to say to her, and she had no idea how to get him to say it, except to give him time. Excuse me. I lost a daughter, he said, two years ago. Oh no, I'm sorry to hear that. She'd been struggling with drug addiction. Well, damn, Danielle said. The situations aren't really equivalent, I guess. Your daughter was murdered. Dead is dead, Danielle said. That seems pretty equivalent to me. How old was she? Twenty, the same as Eden. He met her eye, this lost man. What was her name? Gabriella, well, Gabby. That's nice. As is Eden, how did you come up with that? I thought, you know, innocence. I was young. I didn't take into consideration the whole apple and snake deal. He took a sip. She looked at her wine. It brought to mind a urine sample. She left it where it was. So that's why you gave me your card, she asked. He finished his drink. You want another, he asked. I should probably go ahead and take my first sip of this one. He headed off for, the, for his refill. Once again, she watched him at the bar. If this was a date, he'd have been the best looking man she'd ever been out with, also the wealthiest and the nicest. She thought about that, a date with Patrick Noon. He'd spend $200 on dinner and be a gentleman when he said goodnight, and then, he'd have rushed, and then she'd have rushed home so she could tell Eden all about it. But this wasn't a date, and she wasn't going to be rushing home to talk to her daughter ever again. When he returned, she resisted the urge to fill up the silence. The man had his own rhythms that she knew better than to disturb. They half listened to that song about Sister Christian as it gargled inside the nearest speaker. You'll hear her voice, Patrick said. She had to run what he just said through her mind a few times to make sure he'd, she'd heard it right. Okay, she said. Has that happened yet? Danielle knew that if she said anything at that moment, she might lose control. So she, she simply shook her head. You will. She won't say anything important. I mean, she won't tell you who killed her. No lottery numbers. It'll just be normal stuff. I could probably live with that, Danielle said. That's why I was out there that night, driving around. I was asleep, and then I heard Gabby ask me to come pick her up. I mean, obviously, I knew it wasn't real, but it unsettled me. So it was a dream. Not really. Her voice didn't come from inside the, if, her voice didn't come from inside the sleep, if that makes sense. It came from somewhere else, and no, I don't believe in ghosts. Daniel was wishing this didn't all seem so goddamn plausible. The funny thing is, her voice wasn't like it had been when she was alive, at least not those, those bad last years. But she wasn't a kid either. It was like what it would have been now. He was still staring at his empty glass. Finally, he looked up at her. So, after I hit the dog, I saw someone. Suddenly, everything in the bar became a lot clearer and a lot quieter. What do you mean, Danielle asked, you saw someone? When I got out of the car to check the dog, Patrick explained, there was a person there in the trees at the edge of the property. I tried to speak with him, but he didn't answer. He just stood there like he was trying to be invisible. And then a dog attacked me and when I checked again, he was gone. Well, do you know who it was, Danielle asked. I'm pretty sure I do, Patrick answered. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so, and then things happen. <laughs> so, um, anyway, if you have any questions or want to discuss it or ask me anything you want, um, I've had all sorts of questions. Somebody recently asked me if I would be interested in um, learning about AA after I read this this book, and I said, "No, it's Patrick who has the drinking problem, not <laughs> not me." I mean, I like so. Uh, I had a friend who wrote a book about um, a guy who was impotent, and he had two guys coming uh, for an impotence cure. And, and so, but so uh, these are my characters, not me. So there's, <laughs> I get all sorts of, so please feel free to ask me anything um, about the book, about my the career, about writing, about whatever. Um, does anyone have any questions? I'd happily answer them. Um, yes, yes. So I read it. Oh, okay. Um, I noticed my flashlight is on. <laughs> Apparently, I can't see you. <laughs> Um, I noticed that you wrote it from the perspective of everybody but the teenagers. Right. 
What made you do that? Because I think you could have gone deeper if you had included teen, uh, not deeper, but darker. Right. If you had included the teenager's thoughts. Yeah, I mean, that, that could be, my motivation for that was simple. Um, I have four children. They have all been teenagers. Mm -hmm. And I don't think any of them have committed any major felonies. Um, uh, but I do know that, and this is experience my own mother had and all my friends have, is that teenagers are, are very good at keeping secrets. Mm -hmm. And a parent's relationship with a teenager is, is very difficult in that regard. And that teenagers naturally don't like to sh share things with their parents. So I thought it would be interesting to tell a story the mystery of which was based on that truth about how, how um, you know, how how teenagers can, 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 can teenagers are basically mysteries to their parents in a lot of ways. So I thought, why not turn that into a mystery story? So that was really it. In terms of yeah, going darker and stuff, I've I've written books with told from the points of view of teenagers. Too, Human Capital has has two teens in it who, who, um, who are, are a huge part of the book. And, but this time out I thought, you know, just, just to focus on, on the parents, you know, and, and to play on that, that basic fact I just told you that, that I know in my life it was, you know, w w with our children, um, you know, it, it never became to this level, obviously, but there was always this sense of they have this hidden life, you know, and then, and then who are the detectives in the book? I mean, um, well, there are two detectives, but as you've read it, they don't play a huge role in the book. But the detectives are the parents. And, and a lot of your relationship with your kid is, is a kind of detection when they're teenagers. You don't want to cross the line. You don't want to spy on them. You don't want to have them followed or anything like that. I mean, necessarily. But, um, but you do have to spend a lot of time trying to figure out clues because you're worried about your kids you know are they depressed are they this drugs all of that so anyway that was my motivation I mean I appreciate what you're saying um, the, was it Jack was that his name you he, he's just so creepy <laughs> now no spoilers no. <laughs> no, no, no spoilers you, you did such a great job without giving too much away yeah. about the, the, the depth of his he's off yeah and I feel like I killed to have a book of just him. Yeah. From his perspective. Well, this is this is. Um, <laughs> but he's not based on one of your kids, is he? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, my my kids aren't like him at all. Um, okay. I hope. <laughs> to me, they're not. Um, it, it's funny you say that. <laughs> no, the reason I laughed, I look at my wife and smile, is because we had the conversation last night, a couple nights ago. This has become part of a trilogy. Snap. Uh, and and uh, I'm just finishing the second one. And the third one, and what happens in the course of the trilogy is that Detective Gates, the, the, the very nice female detective, becomes a bigger and bigger character in the second book, becomes qu quite big. And then the third book is hers. So she is this new detective in Emerson, and she's on a learning curve. And we may very well not only see Jack again, but see his story in the third book. So oh, this I... This is coming out, the second one? Uh, the second one, well, I gotta get it to my publisher. Uh, okay. So I'm, I hopefully by the end of this year, or very early next year, that's the second one. The third one is, will be, I'll begin immediately after that. And so, you know, hopefully within the next two years, those two will be out. Um, no redemption for Jack. There uh, isn't, it's messed up. Uh, um, I, uh, spoilers, but I mean, like down the road. Well, you know, I think there's there's potentially redemption for everybody. Um, uh, you know, I but um, I don't know. Uh, um, I'm gonna have to think about that. And it's been it's fascinating to talk to you guys and and to have, I've had a lot of one of the one of the good and bad things about publishing these days, as opposed to 20 years ago, is you get a lot more contact with readers because of Instagram and so forth. And, you know, 20 years ago, you would occasionally people writing extremely nasty things about you on Facebook and, and, and you know, and that would be it. And then you get critics and, you know, so, um, but now, you know, you do get a sense of how people are, are reading it. Fascinating to, to talk, to, you know, to hear that. I've got very thick skin, so, you know, whatever. But, um, 
Yeah, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, I mean, Danielle comes back. You know, the 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 there will be um, there will be. But the main person who's going to come back is is this detective, this detective from Boston, who's who's been sort of by book two she is now working for the Emerson. She's a state policewoman, state police detective in the first one, who kind of comes in to help. And the second one, she's taken over the department, basically, and is much more involved. And the third book is, um, is, is, is going to be, you know, her, her point of view is going to be a very big point of view in it, because she doesn't have a point of view in this one. So it's still kind of all there in my mind, but What's it is... making you trickle her through the three books? Why is she the kind of character that you really keep, keep going with? Um, she's not that big of a deal. I mean, I, I like her, yeah. and I like the way she approached everything, but she's not the book. Well, no, she isn't. That's that's a good point. I I think she's. I think I. I, I don't really have a character I want to pull through all three except her. And I really like the idea of there being a character who comes in and is kind of minor, and and then by the end of it, you know, becomes increasingly involved. And then by the end of it, and and, and as an outsider, uh, in terms, she's African American. She's she's from Boston. She's she, this whole world is strange to her, and she has to tread carefully. And so, again, it's you know a lot of the stuff are are instincts on my part. So I, it's hard for me to answer until I've done it. But but it certainly is very um, you know. And I I didn't start out writing a trilogy. It, it was only as I got to the end of it I thought I, I like this terrain. I like this town. I like it. This town I've invented or imagined, which is Wellesley. And um, um, uh, so, um, so, and it seems like, you know, I like books, I like, I like to write crime books where there, where the, there aren't, there aren't badged detectives solving crimes. I mean, I like to read ones where there are, but I don't like, you know, but I thought, that I'm kind of building up to writing one of those, which I've never done before. And I, and I like her a lot. I like her sympathy. I like her humanity. She has quite a complicated backstory, which will come out in the second book. She befriends a woman who's in a very difficult position, an Italian woman, um, who lives there and has lived there for 20 years uh, and is the mother of some kids who go there. And so they become friends and there's a very complicated, not complicated, but a very difficult situation that the Italian woman is in and she, and so, you'll see. Can you tell me, um, do you outline your books before you start your book? Um, and what happens when you have to flip the book like you did this time where you start one way and right. how do you feel and respond to that kind of situation? Tired, um, <laughs> uh, uh, cranky, angry. Uh, um, so, it, Yes and no. I mean, it's it's kind of a balance. I you know I certainly start out with some sort of outline, mm -hmm. uh, but I, it usually is for like the first half of the book. And I mean, one of the problems with, and this is something that my occasional forays into screenwriting, which drives me crazy, is how producer-oriented screenwriting is, and how everybody wants to have an outline. Exactly. And I'm like. You're, ta you're talking about nothing. It doesn't exist yet. How can you have an outline of, you know, I can do an outline of this book, but, but so I basically, what, what I like to do is, is get a strong sense of character. That, that, that's kind of my outline, is, is I spend a lot of time building characters. So, and then as I write, I have them interact. And in a way, if, if, if I've done my job building a character, building six characters, 10 characters, and putting them together in a geographical place and time, their interactions will dictate the story in some ways. And I suppose it's there in my head some way. My fear in, in I can outline, you know, I'm, I'm a smart guy. I can, I can do an outline for a 400 page book. The difficulty with that is you tend to sort of box your characters into, into a conception you have. I have a student right now, um, in my, I teach in Italy, and she's writing this huge quintet of novels, and and she's she's in Poland, and 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 she's like her English is very good, and it's kind of a fa fantasy series about an all-woman 
world or something. I don't know. It's it's, but it's completely outlined. I mean, it's like 100 pages, and it's all it's just an outline. And I keep on saying, write something. <laughs> I, I can't talk about this. You know, it's like, and then book three, chapter eight. I'm like, give me book one, chapter one, and it's driving me nuts. And nobody can, sh and I think there's an element of fear in that. But but I you know. I think as I get older, uh, and I do this more, I think this is my, what, eighth novel, and I just finished my ninth, I, 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 I'm more confident that I can do it. So I don't feel any sort of sense that I have to, like, beat it out before I start. And, but it, there, is, there is, now, with Daniel and, 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 and Patrick, who you just alluded to, I think, um, yeah, I mean, so that's the whole thing, is you want to be able to surprise yourself as a writer. Absolutely. You want to be able to like have a character, well, and with Gates, Detective Gates, you want to have a character who starts out as just a kind of functional person. I mean, Patrick really started out as someone who saw something and reported it. And, and th but then he started drinking, and I'm like, oh, this is interesting. <laughs> and he, he's actually based on, um, we lived in Wellesley for a while, and I was walking out for a walk, as I do, and I was walking through the Whole Foods Wellesley parking lot around 5 p.m., 6 p.m. And there was a BMW th M3, which is an $80,000 car, parked in the far corner of the parking lot. And there was a man sitting in it. And there was, it was, wasn't near anyone, and it was really far from the door, so it, it couldn't have been like he was shopping. And this car was, you know, to be classist here, it was way too expensive to belong to anybody who worked at Whole Foods, <laughs> unless the owner was, was visiting. And so, I walked by, you know, and there was a man in there, very good looking guy in a Bruno Cuccinelli suit or something, and listening to rap music, really loud, white guy, really loud, and was sitting there with napkins all over his lap and eating a whole chicken, wow. whole chicken, and he had like a 40 ounce Pabst Blue Ribbon. And he was just eating it like this, and the, you know his face was glued. But but he he obviously was an investment banker or something, and and it was such a. I mean, Patrick never behaves like that in this book. I mean, I don't know. I think he does, but but it's just this idea of this, what you know, what was he going home to? You know, four million dollar house where he's eating ergonomic you know oats and 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 whatever. And this is his like primitive moment, and this this disparity. And I started thinking about, you know that sort of unhappiness, that sort of uneasiness in one's very expensive skin. And, and that kind of became, and then Danielle was based on my barber, who was a, a woman with 100% body tattoos um, from, from South Boston, who would regale me, Jennifer, with, with tales of the AM radio show she just heard all day, and, and was, and, but had a kid, and she really loved this kid, and he was in all sorts of trouble and stuff. And so, um, they were kind of based on those people, and I started, but they were both minor characters. Danielle really didn't appear much in the book. She's just a grieving mother. But they, I put them together, they, they hit it off, as they, you see, and suddenly, you know, the book is, they become almost the moral center of the book. So if I, and if I'm not doing, I'm sorry, I'm going on and on, but if I'm not doing that for myself, if I'm not surprising myself, I, it, it's not worth it. I don't get paid enough. I mean, it's not like I'm, you know, have an M3 sitting in the parking lot. So it's like, I, I, I the, the, you want to create a place where you can surprise yourself. And I guess that's why I've said, let's do a trilogy, you know, and let's, uh, I haven't told my editor about this yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Deb? <laughs> um, so, I hope that answers your question. So, anything Thank else? You. Um, Yes. I had a question. I was just wondering, I only know what um, Margaret read about you, but what took you to Italy and what brought you back? Uh, I never lived there full time. So oh, really what brought me back is a plane. I mean, what, I, I go there, uh, I, uh, it was the absolute luck. I mean, I was trundling along and I wrote a book called Human Capital in 2002, I think it was, 2003. 2003. And it came out here and did okay, and it, it was bought for the movies, and the American indie, indie company bought it. And I had this director named, who was a 400-pound Israeli-American guy who, you know, like Oblomov, he'd sit on the sofa and wouldn't move, and we'd work on scripts together. But that never happened. Um, so I thought, okay, 
so it goes, you know. But then I got a call from Italy, and and um, and I know I knew my my books had kind of. I have a very good publisher in Italy and a very good translator, so I knew my books were semi-popular there. And I got a call from Paolo Verzi, who we've, uh, who's one of the big directors in Italy, and he said, I want to do your book, oh. in in um, Brianza, which is a very swank suburb of Milan. And I said, okay, he said, can you write the screenplay with me? I'm like, well, let me, let me call my agent. But I couldn't because for contractual reasons, it's boring. But um, so I didn't know what was going on. I knew they were making the movie. And I got one picture from the set or a couple. And, um, and then he invited me to Italy to see it. So I went over and it became, I, I literally flew into Rome right before Christmas and I got, there was a limo for me and I'm driving in and there's a billboard with my name on it. And I'm like, well, I think the movie's doing well. And it was the number one movie in, in Italy. And uh, it was quite a thing. <laughs> so it's like completely accidentally. And I met the cast, uh, whose names I won't try, um, Please. who were all uh, extremely good. They were a lot better looking than I imagined them in my head. Um, uh, and. So that became a big success, and then after that I was offered a job teaching at a school in Turin, and so I go there twice a year, and it's great. And I teach in English to international students, and um, you know, from all over, it's a place called the Holden School, after Holden Caulfield, um, a book and a character I hate, but don't, don't tell anyone, although I think I just said that on TV. Um, <laughs> But, but yeah, so I'm just lucky. It's just luck. It's just luck. I mean, the thing is, if you write a book, you never know what's going to happen. Most of it's bad, but occasionally good things happen. And so I, I don't attribute it to any. And my Italian is pretty, pretty grim. So um, um, it's hard to learn a language when you get older. <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a two-year-old's game. It's not. <laughs> right. So yeah, just luck. Yes. How crazy is it to write a screenplay from a book that you've made? Well, I, I think I think the lesson I've learned in that regard, and I've I don't I've never written a screenplay that's been I've written a screenplay that's been produced, but it wasn't from a book I wrote. I think I think the 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 lesson I've learned from that, and I now know, is this exists, right? This this is here. It's never going away. Um, and you, you have to not see yourself as the protector of this book when you write a screenplay. I, I, teach, I teach courses in film adaptation at, at, at the school, in the adapting books into films uh, at my school in Italy. And I have, there are other teachers there, and they go through these whole big procedures, right? About how you adapt a book into a film. And they have all these rules and all these strategies. What I've learned in my, in my experience is there's, there's one rule, and it's there's somebody with money, and there's you. And you do what they say. <laughs> so there's a dude with money and a writer without money. And you could fight them uh, and get fired. And so somebody has a vision. Film is very, very, a screenplay is very different from a book. And I think a lot of mistakes I've made um, is you think you're just rewriting the book with a lot more white on the page, you know. And, and, but so I just now I'm like, you know, if you want to make it into a movie, and I really trusted um, Paolo. I had to because I wasn't on the set in Human Capital. And they, and they did a really good job. And, you know, I've never met a, a director, usually it's a director, it could be the producer, who doesn't have an extremely strong vision of how they want to do the movie. And I think your job is almost to work for them and not your book, if you get the thing. And if you go in, unless you're Stephen King, and you'll notice he has no participation whatsoever in his, he just sells it and writes another book after he used to. Um, but so it's, 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 it's not tricky so much if you just listen to the director. Because on a film, directors do everything. Everything is the director. I mean, there's no director of cinematography. There's no director of light. The red directors, I, a friend of mine who directed several really good films said, he just sits in a chair all day. 
Directing is just sitting in a chair all day and someone comes up and says this one or this one, and you're like that one. And then someone else comes up and says this one or this one, and you're like that one. And that's, that's it. And then you choose the angle of the shot and talk to the actors. So I'm going on and on. But um, if, if someone asks me to work on the screenplay to this, I'll say, well, how do you see that going? What's your vision? Why do you want to do this? So do you now, in your contract, have a right of first refusal for doing a screenplay? Like, did you change that up since... You know, I, that's, that's, that's an interesting question. Those are a lot less standard than they used to be. Um, uh, they will certainly, you can refuse. <laughs> I mean, you can refuse anything. It's my book, you know. Um, they, it used to be as a matter of course, they would offer the, the writer, uh, the, the novelist, uh, an opportunity to write the first screenplay, but it, it would just be another form of payment, and then they just throw that away and get a professional in most of the time. And if you have a really good agent, you'll get a credit. But um, nowadays, it's a lot less prevalent. And in terms of c contracts, it's a jungle. I mean, it's a gang fight. You just do whatever you can. I mean, if you're if you're I'm see in the large print of Gone Girl staring at me right there, and it's like, yeah, Gillian Flynn. Uh, can, can do that, uh, but you just say thank you and whatever they have in mind. But, there, but there's no sense of, you'd be crazy, I think, you'd be crazy to go in unless you were really a powerful person uh, in terms of book sales, to go into a negotiation with a precondition about you wanting to do it. And um, it's a very time-consuming thing. It's a very... Um, can be a very painful and unrewarding un thing that doesn't pay very well at all. I mean, the money, if you really, to be honest, if you're a novelist, the money you make is for the rights. If you get involved in some sort of labor intensive screenwriting, you're going to, it's, it's not. Write another book, you know. That, that's, that's where I am coming from now, you know. But everything is different. The market is completely wide open now with TV and this and that. It's just, it's just, I, I just don't know. <laughs> you want the sale. And it, once you get the book sale, after that it's gravy. Um, well, yes? The thing we were talking about was how we really liked how you wrote from a woman's point of view. Do you, is there going to be any problem writing from an African-American woman's point of view? Do you see any, yeah? <laughs> Not for me. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I mean, I, I, you know, I, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's 2023. Obviously, it's a risk. And, and you know, but I, I, I'm, I'm not terribly interested in men, uh, in, in their psychology and their their, their complications, and, and so I'm much more interested in, in women as, as a writer. I just find them much more compelling to write about. Um, and in terms of African American women, I, we'll see. I mean, I, 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 you know, I like her. I, I, I don't see any impediment to me doing it, but I know there's, there's you know, uh, there are people who, who don't like when that happens. And I, I respect that, I really do. I mean, I really do, but on the other hand, it's just the way I see the book. And look, hey, I got a dog run over in the first sentence of this book, so I don't feel particularly, uh, t turn that off. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, I'm, I, look, hey, I'm nervous about everything, right? But I think it got, it's gotten less. I mean, it, got, it was really crazy there for a little bit. Yeah. But, and maybe it's toned down. I think so, I think, I think so, and I think, you know, it's a broader discussion, but but there definitely was was uh, a lot of learning that had to go on, <laughs> and I think I think it has. I mean, I'm not going to say everything's hunky dory, but I certainly think that you know you know there's been a lot of education and a lot of learning, and I think it's been really good. And I, I certainly write with a lot of that in mind. I think it goes too far. For instance, in this book. There was a point where Oliver comes back uh, from his trip with the Germans, and Celia says, how was it? He said, Germans have really bad senses of humor. 
which by, for the record, they do. Germans have the worst senses of humor. And he says, it's all farts. It's all farts and breasts, he says, which for the record, it is, right? And don't, Robin Williams said, you know, it's like, um, and my editor, or my editor's assistant who was line editing the book said, maybe we should cut out Germans, you know. You should cut out what? Germans. Oh. <laughs> and I'm like, really? We're afraid of offending Germans? <laughs> I think, we, I think we've reached the end here. It's like, Germans, really? <laughs> they admit it. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, anyway, I don't want to get too far into this conversation <laughs> on TV. You did an excellent job writing a woman's perspective, though. We did, we both definitely. Oh, well, thank you, thank you. We did a better job than I've seen other people do. Yeah, I mean, um, it's funny, because my, my daughter, 23-year-old uh, daughter, is a, is a turns out to be a really good novelist and she's just written her first novel and it's it's I'm just blown away by it and I had no participation in it um, and it's written from a man's point of view with a, a boy's point of view not a boy but a boy her age's point of view and I don't know I mean it's like you know I spend a lot of time I have a wife and three daughters and and you know growing up I spend a lot more time thinking about what women are thinking than what men are thinking <laughs> let me just put it that way so or feeling so um, yeah I mean thank you thank you thank you I should have just said that right off the bat and not said anything else so I'm gonna call you out if they, you know because if you're reading it say like this is so wrong you yeah. never think that I mean, yeah well, I, 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 I'm open to that, and I get it, so yeah. I'm so if you, anybody wants me to sign anything, I will, but if not, that's fine too. Um, and uh, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.